Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to CPSC's public meeting on the e-filing alpha pilot. I appreciate everyone's patience while we were um, getting ready and, and getting started this morning. I'd like to welcome everyone. My name is Jim Jaholski, and I'm the Deputy Director of CPSC's Office of Import Surveillance. Um, shortly, we're going to do introductions um, of the CPSC staff participating in the meeting, as well as all of the importers and brokers that are either in person here in um, Bethesda at our headquarters or are on the phone. Um, and we appreciate, again, everyone's uh, attendance and, and your volunteering to participate in the pilot. Um, before we go any further, I'd like to invite uh, Chairman Elliot Kay uh, to give some opening remarks. There we go. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I took off my jacket in part because I really want everyone to have a very comfortable experience here and to really open up and to have a dialogue that goes back and forth about this experience. Uh, this is a really important endeavor for us, and we're very, very grateful for each and every one of you for your participation. It has really made a big difference, and it's been a huge public service. And I really, I mean that all, with all sincerity. This has been an incredible lift for the United States government, as many of you are intimately aware. And we're not doing this alone. We have been doing this in conjunction with the 46 other agencies that have border authority to try to create that streamlined single window that is now finally online. It's got a long way to go. A lot more enhancements are planned for it. But the point is to make this easier to facilitate trade, to better target our resources, as I think you would want us to be doing on those who are non-compliant, and to make it so that there's just better communication, that when holds are put on goods, you know why, you know who's done it, you know why, what the purpose is, you know what the timeline is, and you know who to interact with, and there can be a good communication back and forth. So our part in this was really to get this alpha pilot going, to test the plumbing to see if we can get something off the ground, an electronic filing system in a rudimentary form, provide the registry to make it as easy as possible. I think it was a brilliant idea with our staff and the contractors to come up with to try to make it so that you can just have one number that allows us to pull from that registry any data that you put in there. And we feel like, and I'm sure Jim and the team will go through it, we feel like it has gone very well, but we of course want to hear your feedback, the good, the bad, and the ugly because it was just an alpha pilot, and the plan is to do a beta and to take it to the next step, and your help and your participation in that, and I hope you'll continue, is going to be vital to trying to get it to be an even better system. Clearly, we're going to be going through a transition here, like the entire government is going through, and there will be different priorities by different leadership at the agency at some point this year. My hope, though, especially while the current composition of the commission is the same, is that we will continue this effort and that we will do our part to be part of that single window as envisioned. I don't think it's good for anybody for CPSC to fall off and for the government, the rest of the government and the rest of the agencies to move in one direction and for us to stall out. I don't think that serves anyone's purpose. And so my hope is that even with leadership change, that you'll continue to be vocal, you'll continue to be present, and you will express your interest in, with the CPSC continuing to do its part to be part of the streamlined process. So I don't want to take up any more of your time. You're definitely not here to listen to me, nor should you be. Uh, I hope you don't mind. I'll sit in the back and just hear some of the discussion, because I really am very interested in it. And I, don't, I hope you don't hold back. I hope you let us know. This only works, and it only gets better if you give us your full and candid feedback. So thank you very much, and thanks, Jim. Thank you. So I wanted to talk, about, talk briefly about sort of our agenda for today. Um, I'm going to going to kick it off by by reviewing a brief PowerPoint presentation, providing some background on the uh, on the Alpha Pilot. So our our volunteer participants are are going to know this information very well, but the slides will provide some basic background for those that may not be as familiar with the uh, with the pilot. Then we'll get into the main reason for the meeting and uh, where we will spend most of our time. 
which is to hear from the participants uh, and better understand, understand their experience uh, in the pilot. Um, we plan to organize today's discussion around five topic areas. Uh, we want to talk about data. Uh, we want to talk about uh, the product registry, uh, broker interaction uh, with the importers, uh, the filing process, and then recommendations uh, for the future. Um, due to time limitations, <clears throat> excuse me, we, we plan to be done here by, by noon today. Uh, we're going to limit the discussion on each topic to about 25 minutes. Um, we'll also stop about halfway through for, for a 15 minute break. Um, if time permits, we will also try to answer any questions uh, from uh, those in attendance here or anyone watching on the webcast, and those questions can be sent to efilingpilot at cpsc.gov. So before we go any further, like I thought it would be good so that everyone could kind of identify themselves and, and perhaps we could just start with CPSC staff real quick. Again, my name is Jim Jaholski. Um, I'm the Deputy Director of the Office of Import Surveillance. Hi, I'm Lisa Reedmiller, and I've been the project manager on the e-filing alpha pilot. So the sharpest dressed guy in the room is obviously the <laughs> IT guy. So uh, my name is Ming Zhu. I'm from the Office of Information Technology. John Blasher, International Trade Specialist, Import Surveillance. All right, great. Thanks, everyone. And um, so why don't we go with the go around and uh, the participants can identify themselves. Um, Fishman and Tobin. Bob Hammett, Logistics and uh, Customs Compliance. Brittany Carrington, Compliance and Logistics. I'm Keith Corkdale, I'm Director of Product Safety. Uh, Fruit of the Loom, Russell Brands, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, this is Charles Sanders, responsible for Customs and Trade Compliance. And then on my team, I have Tara Haas and Amber Tranum. We also have representatives from a quality uh, department as well. John Barry and Christine Willis. Great. Great. Uh, IKEA? Uh, on the phone from Sweden, Magnus Björk, working with product, product compliance. Good morning. Good morning. Lori Everill, IKEA, Customs and Compliance for North America. Uh, Mizuno? Hi there, Amy Cross. Uh, Customs Compliance Manager and Linda Drenning, Analyst. Great, thank you. Procter & Gamble. On the phone, we have Customs Compliance and Regulatory, James Crayley, Nancy Irons, and Dan Gamble. And with us are our import partners, Expediters, Cheryl Johnston, and Callie Colton. Great, thank you. Uh, 7th Avenue. Good morning. This is Jennifer Allen, the Trade Compliance Manager, and I'm here with um, Compliance um, Analyst Allison Obert and Garrett Wayne, as well as our Quality Managers, uh, Mary Aikholzer and Bill Schaffer. Great. Thank you. Walmart? I'm Ken Henson with Product Safety and Compliance. I'm Jennifer Horner with our Direct Import Customs Team. I'm a Director of Compliance and Regulatory. Audit. And then on the phone, uh, Kara Rose with Product Safety and Compliance. Great, thank you. Um, moving to the brokers that participated, uh, Border Brokers? Yes, uh, this is uh, on the phone, Renee Barrera. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I, I know Expediters. <coughs> Good morning, this is Ian Smith. I'm the uh, senior Manager Customs Compliance for our, our U.S. and Brokerage uh, Customs Operations. Uh, and Geodis? Hi, this is Chris Alonzo. I am the Director of Customs Brokerage for Geodis. Great, thank you. So now I'd like to just move into some, oh, I'm sorry, did I interrupt someone? Sorry, I just, this is Jennifer Van Gundy. I'm a compliance manager also for Geodis. Good morning, Jennifer. Um, so what I'd like to do now is just run through some quick slides just to kind of level set and give some background on the pilot. So what was the pilot? Um, this was 
a joint effort between CPSC and CBP to test electronic filing of uh, certain targeting enforcement data. It was a test conducted with a small set of volunteers that are all participating in this call who really did work collaboratively with us in CBP to make this uh, what we feel a successful pilot. And we came up with a two-prong approach to collect the data. Uh, and I'll talk about these in just a little bit more detail in subsequent slides. But um, a, full a full PGA message set and then the reference PGA message set uh, using the CPSC developed product registry. So for the full PGA message set, this was a fairly straightforward way of providing the data. The filer would um, file the, the five pieces of additional information for regulated products along with uh, the other required information uh, that CBP would ask for as part of a normal filing. And that information would uh, flow through CBP to CPSC and be available in our uh, internal RAM targeting system. The reference PGA message set um, required that, that the product information be filed in the CPSC product registry in advance of submitting an entry uh, via the PGA message set. So this reduced the amount of information that brokers needed to file uh, because as the information was filed in the registry, the, um, the importer would receive a reference number. And as part of the entry filing, the reference number was the only piece of information, the only additional piece of information that needed to be filed with CBP. And again, we would receive all of that information um, and match the entry to the information in the registry and bring that information into our RAM system. Some of you may remember if you've uh, been um, following sort of our progress on electronic filing that um, in uh, 2013, in May of 2013, the staff had actually um, um, wor was working towards and, and proposed um, to have certificates of compliance electronically filed. So all the information that was required on certificates of compliance uh, to be filed electronically. Based on a lot of discussion and feedback uh, from stakeholders, the commission ultimately decided to limit the e-filing alpha pilot to four data elements from the certificate and then a checkbox that would just indicate whether or not a certificate uh, was available if we were to ask for, for full certificate information. The scope of the e-filing alpha pilot um, was very broad in that um, we opened it up to any product that was regulated by CPSC as well as three products that are on the 15J substantial product hazard list. And those three products were hand-supported hair dryers, extension cords, and seasonal decorative lighting products, holiday lights. As I mentioned, there, there were um, five pieces of information required for regulated products. So in addition to the checkbox, um, the uh, volunteers were asked to provide four pieces of information from the certificate, and those were the uh, identification of the finished product, each applicable product safety rule uh, to which the product is certified, the place of manufacture, including the identity and address of the manufacturer, and the name and contact information for the testing facility on which the certificate depends. For 15J products, for the hair dryers, extension cords, and holiday lights, the information, there were only two pieces of information that we asked for, and that was an identification of the finished product and then the place of manufacture including the identity and address of the manufacturer. So we had several goals going into the Alpha Pilot, and, and we're, we're really um, hoping as part of this discussion today that we're going to see where we are 
as far as meeting these goals. Um, so one of our goals was to partner with CBP and the industry to collect the required data elements using the, P the CPSC PGA message set. We wanted to assess whether the importers were um, able to provide additional data in advance of importation. We wanted to test our, our technical solution, including the, the registry. And we wanted to evaluate the differences between the, the product registry and the reference PGA message set and then the full PGA message set. What were the pros and cons of both of those uh, ways of providing the, the additional information? We wanted to identify any issues in implementing e-filing as well as the, the burden, the cost, and, the, and, the, and the, um, the time and the cost associated with filing the additional information. And we wanted to be able to inform the Commission uh, on um, possible options for uh, moving forward in the future with, with e-filing. And so on this point, um, just to kind of let you know where, where staff um, is, is heading with this. So um, after this meeting, we, um, we will continue to evaluate the data that we received as part of the e-filing alpha pilot, and we will be preparing um, an evaluation report for the commission on the outcome of the alpha pilot. Um, as part of that report, we are also planning to provide the commission with what we see to be the options in moving forward with the beta pilot and uh, a staff recommendation as well. So just some brief uh, high-level um, stats from, from, the, from the pilot, uh, which we stopped collecting data, as you know, uh, at the end of December. So we had a little over 1,200 products that were uh, entered into the registry. Um, all, all based on those 1,200 products, there were over 15,000 PGA message sets that were filed. 99% um, of those were reference PGA message sets uh, involving the use of the registry. So, I mean, clearly from just that high-level information, um, it appeared that the registry was something that, um, that, the, uh, that the volunteers felt was, was a useful way of moving forward. Um, we had a very small number of errors, uh, less than 1%, and um, of, the, of the products that were, the shipments that were entered under the pilot, they, uh, the country of origin, um, we had 12 countries of origin, different countries of origin, and they came in through 15 ports of entry. So thank you for, for your patience as I just sort of ran through those, that, that background information. So now what we'd like to do is kind of me stop talking and start to hear from you all. Um, so our first topic that we wanted to uh, get into is data, and I'm, I'm going to invite my colleagues here to, to jump in with questions, with comments as well. Um, and what we have here as far as questions are just a starting point. We don't necessarily have to follow these. You know, this is sort of to get the conversation rolling. But as far as around these topics, we'd like, to, we'd like to hear from you, and we'd like to kind of understand better what uh, your experiences were in these. So, I mean, just, I'll just sort of kick it off with um, if, um, if you could just elaborate on your ability to gather the data that was required. Um, and, and along with that, you know, were there, were there certain data elements that were easier or harder um, to, to compile. We were interested in that. And I'll just sort of open it up uh, for those here in the room. Um, I think we have a limit of five microphones that can be hot at any one time. So just if you're not talking, if you could um, uh, just, just uh, silence your mic. And, um, you know, we, we invite everyone uh, on the phone. So I'll just sort of open it up if, if anyone would like to, to start the conversation. Hey, Jim, this is Ken Henson from Walmart. Um, you know, as to the first question, kind of the ability to gather the required data, um, for us, that the, the, the ability was easy. It was, it was quite easy for us to gather the, the data. We already have it maintained in, a, in another third-party system. Um, so for us, it was just a matter of going in, searching, extracting the, the information we needed for the registry. 
um, you know, not surprisingly, the challenge around that is 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 the resources required to do it. Um, and we've we've talked about this before. You know, from our standpoint, um, there has to be some sort of automatic automated solution, um, but because it really is a manual process for us at this point. When our when our third party system was was designed and created, uh, it was never with the intention to to have a feed of that information go into our brokers and then or into the into the CPSC registry it was always just a uh, as much a data warehouse as anything mm -hmm. with search capability so that if we were asked for certificate information we could go in and search and provide it to the CPSC in a timely manner but um, but but that that functionality was never intended to be done hundreds of thousands of times you know a year which is what it would amount to uh, as a full as a full implementation of this program, so the ability was easy, but but the resources for us would would be um, would be really high. Okay, Magnus Björk, IKEA. Uh, we had uh, the data in our own system already, so the collection of the data was easy, and we actually decided to build the automated version of this as a part of the pilot to understand more of what it took from our organization internally. Uh, and the only thing that we could see, I could see that was a little bit tricky is that uh, we have typically the identif identification of the seller on our information and we was expected to provide the manufacturer. And that part we didn't actually build in this trial version of the pilot. But uh, uh, it took some time to do the, to create the data fields. And we had some issues internally, but uh, uh, all in all, it was good that we did it because we learned a lot. This is Laurie Magnus. Um, just to echo a little bit about what um, Ken had said and then um, to follow up a little bit on what Magnus had said. Um, so yes, we did, we did use our internal data that we used to generate the uh, GCOC. And we, I think our problem is we decided not to do it manually, but we decided to integrate as part of the pilot. So tying the GCOC information in our database to our entry systems, our customs declaration systems, I think is where we stumbled a little bit. But it was a good exercise, as Magnus had said, um, because that started to, to highlight for us what we had to do to bring the, sh the testing data and all the GCOC data to the specific shipment that we were making entry on. Um, and I think the other thing, as Magnus has said, is we do have some limitations on the actual manufacturer when it is different than who we're buying the merchandise from. Our customs declaration system has that capability to do that, um, but the interface was not there. So that piece was manual. We had to manually type that in for each entry um, so that we could make that work. Yeah, Bob Habit, F&T. Um, we had no problems at all, you know, collecting the data. I think on uh, the challenges probably on the brokers end a little bit with regards to transmitting it to CPSC uh, through the entry, setting up the, uh, the files. Uh, we basically set a common delimited file into the broker with just the registration number tagged on the end of it. Uh, it was, you know, applied to the entry and, and transmitted off. So there was no, not, nothing cumbersome on our end or high expense that was incurred. Uh, just a few hours of uh, programming work. We basically manually keyed the stuff into the registry and then attached it to a style number that was kept in our system. And then when we called up that style number to be entered, uh, it was attached to the uh, transmission and sent over to the broker. So there was uh, not a lot of, uh, not a lot of, you know, cost or, or heartache on our end. However, I, I will say one more thing, and that's in, in a production environment that we, we are doing it. Uh, one thing comes to mind, and we'd like to know uh, what the commission's uh, uh, feeling is on component testing with regards to end product testing in, in a manufacturing environment. So if we were testing buttons and zippers and various items that went in on a component level, uh, 
as the pilot moves forward, are you going to expect uh, finished product testing uh, as a requirement for the uh, the end use of the product or the end result of the product for uh, the registry? So I, th I think on that note, um, so the pilot was set up really to um, only focused on on the finished product itself, the certification related to the finished product. So. Um, I don't I don't see us varying from that perhaps in the future um, that would be perhaps something that the Commission may need to weigh in on but I, I think we would continue to look at um, the finished product that that's been certified Jim I think it's I think it's somewhat telling that you know Magnus and Lori and then Bob and myself all kind of gave a brief description of the way we went about it and and we were all different I think that's going to be part of the challenge too and that's one of the takeaways is I think every every participant in this and probably in the beta pilot and then in full imp implementation is going to have a little bit different approach to this mm -hmm. and so when we do start talking about automation and finding those systems and things it could be really difficult to find something that's going to meet everybody's needs um, j just the the three of three different groups four different groups here in the room all tackled it a little bit different way because of how their systems were already developed right. um, and so trying to find you know, trying to find something that's going to plug into that that's going to work for everybody, I think, could be a real challenge. Yeah, well, I, I think we'll have to rely on our, our technical folks here to, to sort of work with and, and understand kind of what, what are some of those different ways to try to, um, you know, if we were able to move forward with a beta, how, how we can design something that would, that would be as universally applicable as possible, but I agree. I mean, it sounds like everybody is doing it, has done it a little bit different, um, just with the eight companies that are, that were participating. Yeah. One thing I want to I can mention that our system is basically built on the logic now that uh, when you, when we create the normal certificated compliance, this is created in background, automatically. Mm. So we have one task and that is create the certificate of compliance and then the rest of it happens without the user seeing it. So one thing that I want to This is uh, Charles of Screw the Loom. Wanted to know that uh, we, we took a very small sample of our overall product uh, universe to include the pilot program and we work closely with our quality team because we tell some of the data for customs and trade compliance to provide the broker. Unfortunately, we're already providing the manufacturer information because we are an apparel company to the customs broker and to U.S. Customs. And then we got the other additional information from our quality team. So that information is currently stored in two different locations, and we just had to bring it together. But it was easy to bring together for the pilot. But it will be undertaken for us to do the complete universal products that we have. Can I try again? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, this is Jennifer from Walmart. Um, one thing I wanted to add to in relation to this is it's not just about design, but it's also about volume. Um, we tested two tariff codes, two toy tariff codes, and toy is our primary import, direct import. Of the two tariff codes that we tested, um, we had over the last year 44 48, I'm sorry, 48,000 entries on those tariff items that would have to be called through your system in order to, and that's just two. Given the depth and breadth of our product line and what we hit within the tariff, I mean, we're within 88 chapters of the tariff book. And some of the items that you're looking to test, you know, you have whole chapters that you encompass understandably so but it's just the point is that you know with two tariffs and 48,000 entry lines you know expand that to include all the chapters that you're that you have to cover from a CPSC perspective yeah, and I think that compares with the 100 or so entry lines that we that we had for the pilot yeah just for the two tariff codes and two yeah. ports so the 48,000 number is a spread across five ports we had two ports that we used in the test phase, um, and we only did um, what was it, 100, and, or we only entered 62 products into the registry. So, one of the things that we were talking about was, would there be an option for us to? I know that you have the registry option, and then you have the entry option, right? 
getting obviously that forty eight thousand isn't they aren't unique individual products. That forty eight thousand translates to thirty three hundred individual products. So for us that entering that thirty three hundred into the registry and having that data cult, you know, that expands out into multiple purchase orders, multiple entries. You'd be looking at the same things over and over and over again. So it would make more sense from our perspective to cull it down to the product level, maybe just looking at it through the registry itself and then coming back to us at that point in time as needed. Yeah, that's, that's the benefit of the registry is, is definitely the expectation is that on a product basis, especially for a lot of large uh, companies, that you're going to have repeated um, filings that are going to be uh, necessary as you're coming through. So why not post it once and just state with a single ID? And also on our end, if we're able to match up our exams on a particular ID number, I've tagged you once on that product, I'm done as well if it's clean. So we can track that much more effectively as well and get out of the way. And that's, that's part of this process as well. So under kind of following that example though, so, so say you, you take a look at it, you tag it once it's clean. Like, is there any feedback to us as importers so that we don't have to continue filing that registry information over and over again? And I think we're kind of starting to move into maybe what could develop as a trusted trader program or something along those lines. Um, but, but at some point there has to be some efficiencies too at, um, for the importer for, for, you know, importing only compliant product that meets all the requirements, has all the appropriate documentation, that sort of thing. So we're not in the situation where we're just filing hundreds of thousands of lines every year that, you know, aren't really problematic. I, I'm in general agreement. The, the, the basic idea is that as product is reviewed and we've done it once, we don't need to do it again. Uh, and this is, this is uh, staff opinion. Um, that we've got a recordation on that. If we see that in a repeated fashion over and over, you know, we, we pretty much can say the products are, are generally clean. If there's issues, you review it domestically. Um, yeah, so I, I'm in total agreement. Yeah, we're, we're going to need to move in that general direction longer term. Yeah, it's I, a resource I, issue as well. I definitely see the, the where you're going with it. I, I think it's it's we'd have to we'd have to think through how how that works, you know, how, how that works where we know and we're comfortable that that product, you wouldn't need to file any, any longer. Um, I do think it around a trusted trader program is probably, um, absolutely benefits some benefits absolutely. around that. I mean, I, I, I do think, you know, going along like the, the, the scope of the, of the alpha pilot was, was very broad and, and we, we set it up that way because we were trying to, to find volunteers to participate, I think moving forward, it really makes a lot of sense for CPSC to um, to make some decisions on what what data for what products we really need. Right? Um, we have a, we have a vast jurisdiction, um, and but um, you know, quite frankly, we don't have the resources to to target and examine everything under our jurisdiction. So. Right. Where do you make those cuts? You know, where what data is um, is really important to us to uh, to en enhance our import targeting? Right. So that's a that's another area around scope moving forward that we need to we need to look at. Right. Of of the eighty eight hundred that we have jurisdiction over, roughly eighty eight hundred, uh, touching sixty three some chapters, uh, we really only are interested in in terms of standards somewhere in the realm of. 300 to 500 codes where we would be looking for children's products, things for which there are, there are potential issues. It's not going to extend much further than that, we believe. Uh, we just need to get the intelligence to be able to understand, because as you know, some of these HTS codes are, are kind of rough to peel back uh, and, and to know what's in there. And so as we work with ITC to, to clean up the HTS codes to make it easier for us and easier for you to work with us, um, because that's not what the HTS codes are originally designed for. They're for tariff collection. Um, as we are able to stream that down and be more consistent, I think it's going to be easier for everybody to understand how reliably we can set this up in terms of need for the information. Um, so it, it, it takes time for on our side as well. 
I did want to address. Were you going to tell me it's time to move on? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> did you have another? Go ahead, please. I actually wanted to go back to something Magna said, uh, talking about the way you store data at IKEA, because early on we had some email exchanges. And uh, bullet point number, I guess, four on here about voluntarily filing the full certificate data. We've had some people indicate that the way you store data is based on the way CPSC has historically requested it, which is provide us with a certificate. Um, and so we are interested uh, in some inf more information around that because I think it had been expressed by some people that it would have been easier in the beginning just to provide what, everything you had, which was certificate data. Um, can, can we kind of get some feedback around that? Like, would it have been easier? Would, would there be an interest in being able to voluntarily file the full certificate? Not, not only, like we're not taking away, the, I don't think, the option of, of what we've had in the registry, but for some people, would it have been easier to just provide the whole certificate data because that's how you store it? Uh, Magnus, I'll let, uh, I'll let you address a little bit because you did all the manual entry. They manually entered everything into the registry. Um, and I believe we did about 50 yeah. different articles for which we did that. Um, we're similar to Walmart, as you can, if you can imagine the range, in that uh, we're going to have a wide breadth of articles. Um, we only tested with a limited amount. And when we entered the certificates in the registry, it was only for 50 different articles of various sizes of mattresses that were coming only from Mexico and going only through Th Laredo. So it was very, very narrow. Um, but we specifically knew that that's where we wanted to test that particular concept. Um, there were some other issues. So you have the structured and the non-structured on the entity listing. For us, it's just a, it's a GCOC, so it's a, it's a field that has the full unstructured address. Um, imagine having to go back and now unstructure that data for a structured feed, um, if that's the way ACE and CPSC is um, looking forward to moving. So that becomes problematic for us versus just being able to put the certificate on file or being able to mimic the certificate in a data feed. And I think um, one of the other things that we didn't test was an EDI feed into CPSC for the certificate information. Um, that was very difficult for us to set up just for the pilot. But long term, for volume purposes, it would become resource issues if we had to manually enter every GCOC and then think about it from a maintenance standpoint. So if your GCOC changes for that particular product, now you have a maintenance conversation as well. That piece wasn't tested, so nobody manually entered that into the register. Did you want to, add to uh, I can come. I can comment on this. And uh, so that basically, we have the whole certificate of compliance as bits and pieces of data, which means that it's no big deal to assemble it in different ways. Uh, and some of these adaptations was done during the pilot, uh, for the pilot to be able to run it more efficiently. It's a small part to do, but uh, basically, if we through file a full certificate data or if we file uh, the four, these four elements, uh, that wouldn't change very much the administration for us. But it will change the amount of data that goes through the feed into CBP and into ACE drastically if we can reduce it. So. Uh, the issue we had, uh, also I must say that we were running both reference PGA sets and full, full PGA sets for this uh, pilot. And um, what we, uh, my experience with the uh, product register is that it was fairly easy to use. And it was quick if you worked with the, the simple products like the mattress, but uh, toys are messy because you have an enormous amount of different codes to choose between that is well run for a toy. So that is substantially more heavy to work if you're going to do it manually. I would say four to five times worse than a mattress. When you say, uh, when you say codes, are you talking about product codes, organizing those product codes through? Because I know the HTS codes are no, pretty simple. Yeah, now I'm talking about this uh, citations. There's substantially more citations available for a toy than it's for a mattress. You had basically two uh, general versions and two children versions for a mattress. 
but uh, for a toy you have uh, 46 to 47 different uh, applicable citations, which makes the toy much more messy to register manually. <coughs> As Laurie said, we didn't try the feed. Uh, the drawback with uh, feeding the progress reg register to an up data upload is that uh, every time you send something out and want something back, you are at a point where the data flow could break down. And that is the bigger worry. Technically, it, I don't see it as a big issue to solve either. I can mention that we, we have about 3,500 products where we have a certificate of compliance for, and we have an average due to the high amount of the component testing. Uh, about two and a half to three updates per year. So somewhere around 10,000 different uh, certificate compliance during a year. And then naturally multiplying that with the number of entries, I don't know where we end up, but uh, there will be a lot of data that will be fed, a lot. And from Walmart's perspective, it was a, it was a manual entry. So any additional fields that we that we would have to submit would just be more keystrokes and more time and effort. So I believe uh, we're at the point where we need to move on to our our next topic, um, and we want to talk about the product registry. Um, so. You know, again, we got we, we've already sort of the reg discussion of the registry has already been sort of intermixed into um, what we've been talking about so far, um, and I think I, I guess just to sort of kick it off, and you know, I think everyone uh, manually entered their products into the registry, and I, I mean, we fully acknowledge that um, moving forward, there has to be some sort of um, easy efficient way of uploading products into the registry for this to be to for this to be uh, viable for for companies but you know sort of with that um you know would just open it up to any other discussion as far as uh you know thoughts on the registry and sort of what worked and what didn't um you know uh suggestions for the future yes jim this is Lori. um and magnus can can jump in as well um but when you say upload when I think of an upload from a business perspective, I think of somebody sitting down at a computer and uploading the data manually. And I think if you're talking volume, that becomes very unworkable um, every time you get a change. So as Magnus has said, we could have upwards of 10,000 different certificates being uploaded annually. Somebody has to upload that. The preference would be, is there some form of EDI feed for the certificate so that any time a source system is changed, that you can create business rules or triggers that would automatically trigger the feed into the CPSC registry. And then you would have some form of confirmation coming back that it was, a, it was received in the, the number or the register number is the same. I think for larger, larger customers, this is John uh, for CPSC, for larger uh, uh, businesses, it makes a lot of sense to establish that type of an EDI if we were going to move forward. Uh, to definitely have that type of uh, recognition that or there's an expectation that you've got a large array of products for which there may have been a change in your in a component in a, in a particular supplier and therefore you needed to, to alter your uh, your certificate for one reason or another I'm not a lawyer I might not be getting all this right um, but for the moderate and the smaller uh, importer this what you've done really is is kind of their test for somebody that's going to be getting into the system to actually um, file necessarily, and they're, they're, they're moderate, they're small, this is what they have to experience. So this really is, to me, this is still a real live test in terms of the interaction. And I understand being very large, we wanted to get you in the room to, to make sure that we understood where you're coming from and we, we fully addressed your concerns as well. But the, the amount of data and how you did it is, is what everyday um, smaller importers are going to have to deal with. So, uh, this is I, I can tell you like this that the trial, uh, I uploaded most of these certificates myself, personal, just to see how the system works and the logic of it. And uh, it, it, it worked, it was a good layout, good logic, and 
I didn't have any problems with the behavior and so on. Uh, for if you know if you know what you're doing, it, it took me about uh, somewhere close to three three and a half minutes for the second certificate is uploaded. The first one took a little bit more time because you need to define the supplier. But then you, the, the producer of the mattress. But then you could reuse the information. So I would guess that less than five minutes work if you have a normal certificate of compliance. I would guess that for a toy certificate, you probably have to spend two to three times the time to do that. And unfortunately, when I see small importers of toys, they can have quite a lot of different products. It's not just not big volumes of each. Uh, one problem I experienced was that when you do a download of the data from the registry, it doesn't include all the identify, identification fields that you have filled in information in. And that was an issue because one of them contained the data we need would have need to automatically link up the certificate number with the, the rest of our data. Magnus, this is Lisa. We did I, I, we did hear that not only from you but from some of the other participants that uh, the export, the download of what you had entered was great, but it didn't have all the fields you needed. And we do actually have that on an enhancement list for going forward uh, with the beta. Um, you know, a second point I, I think John kind of made, which is that the alpha pilot was pretty small. And we, we did uh, create a web service that was for the direct integration between one of your systems and, and the registry. Um, but I think, well, A, no one used it. <laughs> um, and I think the reason was is no one was planning to do thousands of products in the alpha. And so it became this, you know, is it easier to just enter these 100, 200 products, whatever it is, into the registry, or to set up a whole web services? Um, and obviously everyone chose manual. I think that that choice will change as we move forward into the beta or into um, a bigger a bigger full, you know, full production system, and and maybe web services isn't the right answer too. Uh, we, you know, we we were trying to create something from based on the feedback we heard, but I think we all do acknowledge that some sort of technical integration uh, with the participants or with industry in general, you know, with importers in general who are working this would absolutely be necessary. We, you know, we wouldn't expect that people are going to be manually entering things, large companies. But John also makes the point that, you know, the, what this helped with is there are going to be some small importers who their whole experience is going to be what you experienced in the alpha. That's just all the products they have. And so kind of understanding how the registry helped and how the, the reference PGA versus the pool, full PGA can help some of our smaller importers going forward, you know, is also kind of the outcome and the feedback from, from this alpha pilot. So this is Ken from Walmart. Just a couple of thoughts. One on the on the web services piece, um, and I think this is going to be a, a challenge for all of us too as we look to see how we want to scope out the beta, is that there's also a hesitancy, and I'm speaking from Walmart's perspective, to invest too much in, in systems and development and enhancements and things like that to tie into web services or to tie into whatever the beta might look like, knowing that it's a test and that whatever the final outcome might end up being could be totally different than the, the, the test system that we just invested funds to build around. So, um, you know, from our standpoint, it, it was, uh, it was um, you know, we were being a little more cost conscious as much as anything to, to manually enter it before we go out and uh, engage our IT folks, which usually has a lot of zeros after, after the projects that come with that. So, um, so I think that's another thought around that as, as we start to look forward the beta, towards the beta, we ought to be careful about that as well, I think. Um, the other piece around the product registry, and Kara on the line from our team may have some other comments about this, but I think our experience was it was a good tool. You know, just if, if, from the perspective of a small importer, you know, who won't be doing a lot of this, I, I think we found it to be user-friendly, intuitive, um, really kind of meeting the needs of what someone in that situation um, might might need, uh, you know, that, that, that type of interaction. Um, and Kara, I don't know if you have any other thoughts. Um, but, but generally, our, our, our experience was good with it.
I wanted to, to also ask, I, I know sort of early on in our discussions about, about the pilot, um, there was conversation around the possibility of having um, other entities uh, enter information in the registry on behalf of the importer. Um, I don't think that ever played out, like a, like a third-party testing lab or some other, um, um, some other entity that would, that would compile data. Um, any thoughts on, um, you know, if we were to move forward in a beta, um, you know, the opportunity for that to, to come to come about? Actually, we, uh, <clears throat> we approached a couple of testing labs with regards to electronically sending the data into our companies so we can manipulate it. Uh, keep the data electronically and send it back out. And I don't think they were very, uh, they didn't have a lot of the technology set up to do that. Uh, I think they're waiting for some more direction on which way the pilot and which way this is going to move forward before they invest any, uh, any resources into that. But as this grows and it becomes tens of thousands of, uh, of entries a year for a medium-sized importer, if you're testing three and four different items on a single product, uh, I could see where um, anybody could see uh, that this is going to grow in cost and, and scope and volume to where you're going to need to integrate it electronically. I mean, there's no way, other way to move the information. Nobody's going to be keying that information. It, it's it's got to move forward electronically. Hi, this is Kara. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry. I was trying to speak a little while ago, and for some reason nobody could hear me. Um, just going back to Ken, what Ken had mentioned, the system was um, was easy to use. It was very user friendly. So for smaller importers, uh, I don't think that there would be an issue. Um, it, it was time consuming just based on volume, um, but the system itself was not difficult. Keith and Sanders at Procter and Gamble, and, and I just want to weigh in in agreement with uh, Kara and Ken on uh, we used the registry as well and kind of represented uh, small to medium in the pilot. We didn't have many items that were participating, but we found the registry easy to use. But we do also share Walmart's concern of sinking a lot of money into a automated system that we're not confident would be the one going forward for full implementation. Um, this is Tara Haas from Fruit of the Loom, and I just wanted to weigh in on a few points as well. We loaded around 800 products manually to the registry, um, and although the actual functions were pretty user-friendly, we did find it difficult to edit products if something was entered incorrectly, um, as well as editing the um, saved manufacturer's addresses. Um, so we had to actually delete products to reload them, which added time to the process. Um, also, um, we noticed that when entering the product manually and saving them, that once that save function, you received your reference number, it would bring you back all the way to the main page, which then you would have to choose to enter a new product again. And I think that um, for companies that are manually entering the data, allowing you to remain on that enter page um, would help with some of the time-consuming elements of it. Um, and also, one of the things that we were envisioning in terms of an upload would be potentially like an Excel or a CSV spreadsheet upload, um, as that's how we maintain a lot of our data. Um, we export from our Oracle system and um, pull the data from some other resources, and that's how we currently send to our broker in a lot of um, instances. So having that function would be helpful as well. Hi, this is Linda Drenning with um, Mizuno. We also had um, issues as far as editing uh, in the registry. Uh, I had to delete some of our um, items that were put in uh, as a duplicate, and it took a, it didn't repurpose the number, so it looked like uh, we deleted those numbers for some reason other than it was just a duplicate. Um, we also had trouble. Um, uh, 
with other editing issues. Um, but I do agree with the, the last um, speaker that it can be done, but we need to have it in Excel as well. Um, this is Tara from Fruit of Loom again. I just wanted to add also that um, after the pilot had been completed, we came to realize because the, the um, scope of what we were filing was so small and we picked very specific manufacturers to correlate to specific products that the registry would actually become almost impossible for us to use because the same product can be manufactured at multiple facilities and the product ID or SKU number doesn't change. So we would end up having to load the same SKU number multiple times to generate additional reference numbers to accommodate the additional manufacturer locations. Jennifer Lamb with 7th Avenue. We just wanted to um, agree with a lot of the statements that were made, but also emphasize that we had um, some pretty substantial issues with trying to edit entries and also um, thought that it would be interesting to see if we could create a separate list of manufacturers, names, um, you know, an entity list perhaps, rather than having to rekey that um, by part number. Um, and, and also the list of citations or regulations to have that in a different format so it was easier to, to reference the ones that we were looking for. And this is Keith from f and um, Just to go back to Bob's point about your question, Jim, with third-party laboratories. I agree with Bob. Most of the labs we spoke to, we work with BV, we work with CTL both Walmart laboratories, they have taken a wait and see kind of approach to it. The other problem that when we spoke to them is if, even if you looked at a BV and a CTL report for a Walmart product, they'll look completely different from each other. And in fact, sometimes even some of the test methods could be different for the same product that you're testing. Until we have some kind of standardization as to what the formatting should be and maybe even the test methods, I don't know that we're going to be able to do it as easily as, as we would like to. Um, to go back to what Ken said, depending on what information you're looking for, it could take you several minutes just to find the information that you need to put into the certificate and then finally upload it. And we, we make a relatively small amount of products, but basically in the children's apparel business, somebody like Ikea and Walmart, I, I can't imagine with the thousands of products that they make, how, how much more expansion there would be on that. Thanks. So it sounds like um, a number of companies talked about issues with editing and then the last comment about um, sort of having, I guess, separate lists of manufacturers and regulations, I guess that would be sort of that, uh, that hot list that, that you would keep going back to. Those are um, really good, uh, really good feedback for us. Hi, sorry, just one thing. If you're on the phone, we are getting a lot of kind of background noise here. If you're not speaking, if you wouldn't mind just muting your phone. Thank you. Um, so question, there were a couple comments about, um, you know, going in and, and I guess the attempt of, of editing or changing the information. What, what, um, what prompts, what, what would need that? Is that a, is it, was that a, um, an error, just a, a data entry error that you had to go back and fix? Or was there something about um, the information, a change in the manufacturer or, or something else that, that um, prompted the need to go in and edit the record? Can we just get a little more uh, background on that? Um, this is Tara from Fruit of the Loom. I mean, some of the reasons why we had to go in and edit a record was simple, since it's a manual upload typos in an address or in current country was indicated in an address, um, you know, things that may potentially be eliminated if we're working on uploads. Um, but having someone sitting there, you know, for eight to ten hours a day to, to load the product, um, there were just simple clerical errors. 
Great, thank you. Jim, I, th I think that may come back. Well, we didn't test this um, because we only did the one supplier. Um, but when you have to modify or change something, say you use a different laboratory for a new test, when you retest for your annual testing, that would result in, in having to change your GCOC. Um, if you add a new regulation, I hope you don't, but <laughs> if you add any new testing or regulations, that again results in a modification. Um, so every time you do change management, somebody's either have to, has to go in manually to change it or in the case of, of your large importers are going to have to have some form of a trigger to be able to modify that data in the system. Uh, question though, if you retest the way it was set up in the alpha, as long as it was tested by the same test lab, because we didn't include dates of testing, you shouldn't have had to change that, correct? Correct, but going forward, in a real live scenario where you have multiple laboratories that you're using for testing purposes, it is feasible that you could change your laboratory uh, over time. And, and if we're talking, you know, long-term type of application, I think that's something that you have to think about holistically. Well, yeah. Um, so just sort of um, on complexity, so we're always looking at sort of data that's available in a lot of different ways. It's like, what data is out there? What data, what data could we potentially use? So, you know, there are various dates associated with products, with, with certificates, date of manufacture, date of testing. Would anybody like to offer any, any thoughts on sort of how, <clears throat> how dates would factor into this as far as complexity of maintaining records in the registry or filing data in, in general. How, how often do those dates change and how much of a, of a, of a burden is that? Um, could, you, could anyone shed some light on that for us? Um, uh, I can, uh, Magnus Bjork, IKEA. I could give some input on that. Uh, Today we have an average of, we are doing a lot of the testing on a component level. And because of that, you also get a lot of records in the certificate of compliance due to different test labs and so on. And we basically reissue a certificate of compliance an average about uh, three times, two to three times a year. And uh, that in, its, in itself is not the issue since we need to uh, keep the certificate of compliance up to date all the time. So that's what we have to do anyway. But the logic I looked at for if we're going to use the product registry was to force a new record in the product registry every time we do an update of the certificate of compliance to have a matching. Which means that there were, our human readable certificate of compliance that we could hand out to a customer and so on would match exactly with the information that is in the progress registry always. In, re in relation to dates as well, we have to think about when that product was tested, how often that product could potentially be tested, and when that product's going to enter. So, you know, we have replenishment items that come in, you know, multiple times throughout the year. And if that particular product is going to be tested multiple times a year, we would have to es essentially align our replenishment item with that testing, you know, and even new products as well. So the time of the test versus the actual entry of the product into the registry well, it would have to be done prior to entry in order to make that registry, product registry valid to the item that's being entered or else it'll be negated or rejected. Yeah, and that was, you know, it was um, the commission decision on going with the, with the four elements from the certificate and the checkbox, you know, specifically excluded dates, which really from a data entry perspective in the registry really streamline things because if um, you enter a product 
one time and uh, the manufacturer doesn't change, the regulations don't change, really that product is good in the registry and is valid, that reference number is valid for uh, for as long as you would import that. So that, that really did streamline, I think, a lot of the, uh, the data entry, you know, although, again, you know, a lot, all of you did that, uh, did this manually, but, but it didn't require updates as far as dates go. But we just, we, we really just wanted to have a little discussion around that and understand the, the complexity that dates add to, to the process. Yes, I think, Jim, um, to echo what Walmart has said, um, is that dates become problematic over time, um, and you, we will have to consider um, how your inventory methods and your distribution network function in order to really accommodate the dating, especially from a replenishment standpoint. The other aspect to that, too, from a date perspective is product changes, so colors can change, which can cause, trigger another test on a toy depending on the color. So that, you know, our merchants make those changes all the time without necessarily consulting us first. We just have to act on it. Um, so that can add a level of complexity to the date as well, the date issue as well. So I think we're, we're ready to move on to our, to our next topic, but this is probably a good place to just take a 15-minute break, let everybody stretch their legs a little bit. Um, so um, I think we will pause here, and um, for everyone uh, that's uh, viewing the webcast on the phone, we will reconvene at 1035, and uh, we'll start back up with uh, talking about broker interaction. So thank you.